The city of Atlanta, Georgia, at night, is absolutely breathtaking. Towering skyscrapers touch the clouds as a million tiny windows of light glow like embers of a dying campfire. Some of the taller skyscrapers are dimly lit and sit behind the shorter ones, like faintly glowing shadows with tiny pointed hats. No matter how many times I see it, I still feel like a child in an amusement park every time wanting to take in every attraction all at once. Growing up in the message, I thought of Georgia as an anchor in a life of uncertainty. No matter where we moved to live with other believers, from Arizona to South Carolina, I'd always come back to Georgia to spend summers with my family members. If I was lucky, I'd get to see the lights of the city at night as we passed through Atlanta. I had no idea at the time how fundamental the history of Atlanta was to the message. It was just as important as Chicago, possibly more so considering the historical figures that impacted the city of Jeffersonville, Indiana, and the Prophet. If not for Atlanta, Roy Davis would have never come to Louisville, Kentucky, or fled the authorities to set up his base of operations in Indiana. If not for the men in Atlanta organizing campaigns against the liquor industry, the Prophet's father might never have produced whiskey for the Wathen liquor ring. In one way, one might even say that politics in Atlanta impacted the nation enough to create a Prohibition-era Chicago, cause a saloon to salvation, E. Howard Cadel, and cause white supremacists to invade Indiana government. Atlanta is where the Ku Klux Klan was reborn in 1915, and in more ways than I could even imagine at this stage of my research, created the perfect storm that birthed an Indiana prophet. It's difficult to imagine, but the city of Atlanta was a modern marvel long before Roy E. Davis arrived in the city from Texas to create his double life. By 1900, the city's horizon had already filled with skyscrapers. Horses and buggies strolled the streets below as trolleys carried a massive workforce to and fro as they traveled from their homes to their jobs and back again. By 1915, there were about 600,000 people in the quickly spreading metropolis. Just one year into the First World War, a fuse was ignited in Atlanta that would burn for decades. The war between races exploded into the forefront with the release of D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation. The film told the story of a villainous, psychopathic mulatto, the offspring of a sexual union between a black and a white quote-unquote heroes in white robes rushed in to save the day as an interracial villain terrorized the town. Shortly after the film was released, 15 men gathered on Stone Mountain just north of Atlanta to organize the 1915 Ku Klux Klan. Very little is known about the 15 men who gathered that day. They were led by William Joseph Simmons, but the secretive nature of the Klan's formation remains a mystery. Like the hooded heroes in Birth of a Nation, the men who joined the Ku Klux Klan masked their true identities to instill fear into their opposition. To oppose the Klan and be outspoken was very dangerous during that time. Anyone could be watching or listening. It could be your neighbor. Your co-worker could be a Klansman. You'd better be looking over your shoulder because the politician in office the laborer in a factory, the police force, anyone could be watching. Those who crossed the lines in the sand that were drawn by the Ku Klux Klan were terrorized at night by men in white robes. Many were killed, especially those without white skin. At the other end of the chronological fuse that was lit in Atlanta was an explosion into the battle for civil rights in the late 1940s. I'd spent hours studying that side of the timeline and was surprised how closely the timeline aligned with the spiritual topics in key sermons by the prophet. From the prophet's statements against Martin Luther King to the students seeking equality in the school systems and more, it was very easy to see that current politics of the era created subject matter for the prophet. 
All one need do is line up the sermons by date in one column and line up the milestones in the battle for civil rights in another column. According to his own account to the Shreveport Times newspaper, Roy E. Davis was one of the 15 men who created the Ku Klux Klan that day on Stone Mountain. I knew that Roy E. Davis was the official spokesperson for the Ku Klux Klan as late as 1923, and that he worked closely with William Joseph Simmons. I also knew that Roy Davis worked with Simmons to create other white supremacy groups, such as the Knights of the Flaming Sword. I was curious about the other men among the 15. Who were they? Finding William D. Upshaw, helping Roy E. Davis secure donations for an orphanage in Los Angeles, was the key to unlocking a gold mine of information. Former Congressman Upshaw was a key figure in the message. He entered one of the Prophet's healing revivals, confined to a wheelchair, and the Prophet healed him before the watchful eyes of the visitors in the auditorium. According to the Prophet, Upshaw had been confined to beds and wheelchairs for 66 years. As Upshaw raised out of his wheelchair, the faith in Branham as a healer raised with him. Each and every person in that meeting, many of which traveled miles and miles from other states, went home to tell about the famous figure that was healed in one of the Prophet's meetings. Each person they told went to work and told others. Like a highly contagious virus spreading quickly through a thickly populated city, the Prophet's name spread from person to person. Each person who heard the name, especially those in need of healing, wanted to know more. Learning that Upshaw was working with Davis in the mid-1940s opened the door to several paths of research, but it also raised many questions. Had they worked together since their days in the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan? Or had they just reunited? Was the former congressman's healing genuine, or was it part of a much bigger plan? William D. Upshaw was raised in rural Cobb County, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. An accident had left him bedridden for seven years from 1888 to 1895. A gifted public speaker in the early 1900s, he often spoke from a wheelchair, but his physical disability was not a life sentence. As early as 1915, Upshaw was once again mobile. In an interview with the Shreveport Times, Congressman Upshaw admitted that his days of disability were behind him and that he was no longer confined to a rolling chair. As a fundamentalist Christian with powerful connections, Upshaw used his political influence attempting to wage war against alcohol. He was one of the key figures of the Anti-Saloon League, and Upshaw helped Georgia become a dry state in 1907. He had earned quite a reputation as the editor of the Golden Age publication, a weekly paper well known for its noble and moral tones. He was also a nationally recognized revivalist, one who could attract large crowds. His combination of politics and religion was very popular in the South. By the time he became a Georgia congressman in 1919, he already had the ability to sway political votes in cities across the nation. That fact was evident by simply examining the trail of dry states in the wake of his revivals. From the time he regained mobility in 1895 through the early 1900s, he used a wheelchair as part of his own stage persona. In speeches and sermons across the nation, Upshaw balanced his time between his wheelchair and his crutches. He had a huge setback in March of 1910 when a fall from a buggy broke one leg. Though it hurt him physically, it may have helped him strategically. It further enhanced his ability to gain the sympathy of the crowd. Upshaw's national popularity increased until he became a common household name. He became known as the Georgia Cyclone for his ability to storm through a city like a whirlwind. Posing in his crutches, Upshaw's photo was published in newspapers across the nation. I became curious as to why the prophet said that he had never heard of Congressman Upshaw. In Jeffersonville, Indiana, the town of distilleries, Upshaw would have been public enemy number one. During the same year that the Ku Klux Klan was formed on Stone Mountain, Georgia in 1915, 
Upshaw announced his run for public office. The battle against the liquor industry was soon to have a powerful ally in Washington, D.C. Finding Roy E. Davis and William D. Upshaw together in 1943 was too big of a coincidence to ignore. Davis was also well-connected in Atlanta, and his Ku Klux Klan activities were publicized in newspapers across the state. Upshaw, a prominent member of Atlanta government, would have known all about Davis's sketchy past, even without being involved with the Ku Klux Klan. His knowledge would not only have come from the newspaper descriptions of Davis's dual life and criminal past, both men were nationally recognized revivalists, and they would have known each other in religious circles just as much as they would have in political circles. Looking through the newspapers of the early 1920s, it was very easy to find articles about Roy Davis and William Upshaw. In fact, it was overwhelming. There were simply too many articles in too many newspapers from too many cities and too many states. As an official spokesperson for the Ku Klux Klan, Roy Davis held lectures throughout Georgia and the surrounding states. In 1921, however, I noticed a significant change in acceptance of Davis and the Klan. Though the Ku Klux Klan was very popular shortly after its birth, that popularity would quickly fade as the organization became more violent and terroristic. By the early 1920s, its appeal was quickly fading. In September 1921, the New York World ran a series of articles exposing the Ku Klux Klan for their violence and hatred. According to the publication, the Ku Klux Klan had silently infiltrated America. Membership had grown to over 500,000 members. The Ku Klux Klan had become a political and terroristic invisible empire, a force to be reckoned with. Governing bodies were now being controlled by Klan forces, and that control was secretive, outside of public view. The Klan was suddenly exposed as an anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-black terrorist organization, inciting violence in American cities. William Joseph Simmons had silently gained control of the United States. New York World's exposure of the Ku Klux Klan gained national attention as a result, a federal investigation was suddenly requested by multiple states in the country. The House opened an investigation and William Joseph Simmons was called to testify before Congress. In a stroke of legal genius, Upshaw put an instant halt to the investigation, saving the Ku Klux Klan from an immediate government shutdown. Upshaw urged Congress to investigate all secret orders that were growing in the United States knowing full well that many members of Congress were also members of secret orders. In a public display of support for the Ku Klux Klan, Upshaw himself testified. Congressman Upshaw told members of Congress that William Joseph Simmons was one of the quote-unquote knightliest, most patriotic men that he knew. His speech brought a swift, dramatic end to the congressional investigation of the Ku Klux Klan and secured their right to continue their clandestine operation. If not for Congressman Upshaw, the Ku Klux Klan would have never existed past that congressional inquiry. During the course of investigation, government officials seized all of the Ku Klux Klan records. Documentation obtained from the newsletters sent from Klan headquarters confirmed that William D. Upshaw was secretly a member of the Ku Klux Klan. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together clearly. William Upshaw and Roy Davis were using their evangelism to promote Ku Klux Klan agenda, and the Klan published newsletters painted them as heroes. Upshaw claimed that 39 million persons in the United States had alien, quote unquote, un-American thought. William D. Upshaw and Roy E. Davis moved their base of operations to Los Angeles. It should come as no surprise that when the Prophet held meetings in the Los Angeles area, Roy E. Davis, the Prophet's mentor, sent William D. Upshaw to the Healing Revival for a famous name to become an attraction in the Healing Revivals. William Upshaw, who had not needed a wheelchair for several decades, 
came to the meeting so that the prophet could claim healing of a man confined to a wheelchair. More specifically, confined to beds and wheelchairs for 66 years. While searching through the newspaper articles for articles about William Upshaw, I found something interesting. An article in the Louisville, Kentucky newspaper also described the healing. Shortly after posing as an invalid healed in the Prophet's healing revival, William Upshaw came to Jeffersonville, Indiana to help restore the Prophet's image. This was a story that I had never heard of while in the message and was very surprised that the story had been lost to time. The Prophet had falsely claimed to have raised a man from the dead during revival meetings in Canada, and the evening news had set the record straight. I decided to take a step back from the research of the 1940s to trace the links between Roy Davis and William Upshaw after the two left the Atlanta Ku Klux Klan. In the archives of the Louisville newspaper, I found that Upshaw was in Louisville in 1927, the same time that Roy E. Davis was setting up his base of operations in Louisville. This took place during the time that Indiana Governor Ed Jackson was under investigation for accepting bribes to favor Klan-appointed officials. By that time, Indiana Klan leader D.C. Stevenson had begun confessing to the clandestine operations of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan and had shared records proving that Jackson had bribed government officials. Jackson left office disgraced before a presidential run was possible. William D. Upshaw and Roy E. Davis had come into Jeffersonville in what appeared to be an opportunistic moment in time. The Indiana Klan was in disarray and primed for hostile takeover. Had Davis not been extradited for crimes committed in Arkansas, the Indiana Klan might have looked entirely different. Riding the wave of popularity caused by his backing of the Prohibition Party, William Upshaw announced his own run for President of the United States. It was easy to see that more pieces of the puzzle were coming together, and the faces in the puzzle were beginning to show. William Upshaw was running for president on a platform of prohibition. The Davis brothers were setting up camp in the midst of Indiana clan disarray, next to the liquor distilleries. Roy E. Davis escaped magically from every criminal charge and almost overnight had created a nationally recognized faith healer. I could see the picture forming, but I did not like the image that it presented. In the message, we were so focused on healing that we often lost focus on the bigger picture. Sermons brought so much excitement about the rapture that we were expecting just any day for God to take us to heaven where we would receive brand new bodies free from aches and pains. Then after the sermon, we'd beg and plead with God to fix these broken bodies that we'd be leaving behind. It reminded me of packing brand new suitcases to leave for vacation and making the whole family wait while we took the old ones to a repair shop. At first, I thought I was the only one to notice that in the photographs taken, William Upshaw barely used his crutches. He placed his full weight on his injured leg. But as I researched, I found that others had also questioned the congressman for years. Members of Congress noticed that he barely touched his crutches to the ground as early as 1936. They also observed that with the use of modern bracing made from whalebone, Upshaw really didn't need the crutches at all. One member of Congress claimed that he saw William Upshaw running across the floor without his crutches even touching the ground. He wrote, Old Will was telling about those crutches of his and why he has to wear them. It seems that because he is such an expert crutch walker, touching them lightly and nimbly to the ground, some of them have thought the crutches were part of a costume. He had a row in Washington once when he was in Congress because a man said he ran lightly up the aisle, ignoring the crutches. It burned him to be accused of ignoring the crutches merely because he had mastered the trick of getting the most out of them with the least effort. I could have been angry that William Upshaw plotted with Roy Davis to enter William Branham's meeting in a wheelchair, or that these men were using religion as a means to a political end. Instead, 
I thought of a man forcing himself to hold crutches in public for several decades, only to die a few months after claiming to be healed. I thought of their victims, the faithful followers, who thought God would ignore years of earnest prayer and only listen if a healer was involved. I also thought about how crushed the faithful would have been to watch Upshaw healed right before the time of his death, unable to make use of his seemingly useless healing from his grave after having received a new body on the other side.